Hello and welcome to the Queermonger Institute, our Q&A Conversation for Exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, and along with my wife, Laura Lee, the Director of Research, Education and Outreach, and on behalf of our Board of Directors, Advisors, Volunteers and Supporting Members, we want to thank you for joining us today. The Cuyamonga Institute is an independent, nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness and the human experience, following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist Dr. Felicitas Goodman. And as an educational institution, we take an open approach and invite scholars in related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration, and that's why we call this Conversation for Exploration. And on these weekly Sunday discussions, we've included a full spectrum of topics from neuroscience, uh, anthropology, archaeology, archaeoastronomy, uh, eco-spirituality, uh, philosophy, mythology, shamanism, the hero's journey, really from the arts to the sciences and everything in between. And you're welcome to visit our website at queermongainstitute.com. All of our presentations are free, and as a nonprofit, of course, we invite you to become a supporting member. And we want to thank you, the community members who continue to support the mission of the Queermongay Institute. Today, we look to the stars. Throughout human history, the night sky has been an essential part of our nature. We have looked up to the heavens, we've acknowledged the power and wonder of creation, and ancient people not only utilized the stars to create calendars and to figure out when to plant and when to harvest crops, they named constellations, most of which are still being used today, and they told stories about the heroes, the gods, the animals, the mythological creatures, and, and all of that's represented in the stars. And this goes beyond entertainment. These stories helped the ancient storytellers to teach both young and old and preserve their culture and their traditions. We all know that dark sky is becoming more of a rare experience rather than the norm. Now most of humanity lives under bright artificial light that glows in the skies around our cities, our roads, our industrial activities. The inappropriate and excessive use of artificial light now means that there's an entire new generation who's never seen natural night sky. And this goes deeper. The importance of preserving and protecting our view of the stars has impacts beyond stargazing itself. Dark skies are critical for the well-being of humans, plants, and animals. Animals affected by artificial light include everything from insects, the birds, amphibians, uh, mammals, reptiles, pretty much all of nature as we know it. We need some answers. We need some solutions. And we need to participate. Fortunately, our guest today comes with answers and is dedicated to expanding the research and the science of light pollution to help educate and continue to establish dark sky conservation worldwide. And, and really, I have to admit, I didn't fully grasp the implications and importance of this topic until I started preparing for today's presentation. This really should get equal attention in the headlines and the press as any other environmental concern or topic. Yeah. And you know, um, our greatest stage, I mean, there's so much to do with our history, our culture. It's not just a beautiful view of the sky. It's about such a deep connection that humanity has had for so long with that. The way I see it is that the, um, the greatest stage are the first um, for the first superheroes who had their counterparts in the constellations, you want to see your name in bright lights? Well, these ancient heroes had their image in bright lights in the constellations. And that uh, this is the big screen. This is the greatest stage, our sky. And uh, the first darkly lit screen, in fact. And you can't get any bigger than that. Um, it's held our gaze with blinking lights. It's rather hypnotic. It's captured our attention. It's been the mirror for some deep, deep part of us, a ready canvas to project our dreams, our yearnings, our hopes, and the stories that we tell about our world and our place in it. <coughs> the Milky Way was the roadway, the river, the realm of the ancestors. It was where we were born and where we return after our brief sojourn on Earth. The pole stars were where the gods lived. This was the fixed place of the heavens around which everything else rotated. 
My favorite story, that each star is a campfire, and very like the campfires that our ancestors sat around generation after generation, looking up at the night sky, and feeling at home in this larger community of tribes, these campfires scattered far and wide on other worlds. Now that's community on the grandest scale. We want so much to deepen our gaze of the stars, to expand our view, our view that we've built ziggurats, we've built cathedrals, we've built observatories, and now telescopes. And we've sent the latest a million miles away to yeah. peer even further into time and space. That's the subject of next week. But the cosmos, it's gears within gears. It's the grand wheel, yeah. right? It's the movements of these constellations where a clock of deep time and the solar system uh, is nature's calendar to which we're all geared biologically with our circadian rhythms. We, as you mentioned, it affects all of nature. We can turn off our screens at night. We can close our room darkening curtains, but other creatures cannot. And many are dependent upon following nature's cues for their life cycles, day and night among them. Consider that the dung beetle navigates by the light of the Milky Way. A tiny insect has receptor sites for starlight. So I think so must we be tuned to the night sky and our receptor sites, does it imbibe starlight? It certainly enlivens our hearts and our imagination. It helps us recognize the cosmos as this womb of creation, as our greater home, made as we are of the ash of furnaces of supernovas. In their fiery death, they are reborn as the matter of life, as the matter, in fact, of all matter. And they show us our place in the universe. They tell us that we matter and that we can witness this grand cycle in recycling. And it's not just an intellectual understanding. It's an emotional and it's a spiritual awakening, I find. It's life-changing to see a fully lit, dark sky. Mm -hmm. The darkest skies that you and I have seen have been, I think, Bryce Canyon, car right. camping, away from even the lights of a hotel. Car camp out there in these dark skies. Get up at 3 a.m., sit outside, and so many stars. Um, and they feel like you could reach up and touch them. It's immediate, it's visceral, it's life-changing. It changes your relationship with yourself and all that there is. It's something that everybody needs to gift themselves, that view. And the Australian outback, where we saw okay. even dark clouds in the sky, they were given a name and an identity, the giant emu, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, and it's not just light pollution that's threatening this. It's this coming swarm of satellites and space debris, uh, space debris that eventually may outnumber the visible stars. So mm. there's a lot of threats to this view. So the night sky, it's many things. We've had many conversations around the cosmos, but this is the first about protecting our views of the stars and what we can see with the naked eye. <laughs> and uh, for bringing the International Association of Dark Skies to our attention, we want to thank uh, our friend, our advisor, Tony Hull, astronomer. And uh, we have found John Barentine, uh, astronomer here. He's a member of the International Association of Dark Skies. He's an author with three books on the constellations. He's an advocate, a researcher, and a spokesperson for those dark skies. He's a consultant to the European Federation, to national parks, to municipalities around the world on what each of us can do to lessen the impact of all that threatens those dark skies. So uh, thank you, John. Thanks for being here. It's good to have you here. We're eager to learn more. Uh, and I uh, want to say that um, to help us view the full impact of the night sky, I want to introduce you to a friend of ours. He's a photographer. His work has been featured in National Geographic. Uh, he travels the world, and he's seen many a dark sky, and that is Scott Stolberg. And uh, Scotty is going to show us some images of dark skies around Sedona, an international dark sky community, one of the first. So hello, you two. Welcome. And uh, yeah. Scotty, should we start with you to show us what the full impact of the night sky can be? Hey, everybody. Hey. I want to say Scott uh, goes on photo safaris, and he's going to give us the full depth of his work from around the world on December 11th, Sunday, December 11th. But oh, this looks like Sedona. Yes, this is our dark sky here in Sedona. <laughs> this, 
I just wanted to show people where I where we live. Paul and Laura live just a few miles from me. Um, so uh, this is it's just a beautiful city. It's one of the reasons my wife and I moved away from LA. Um, even though I was teaching at uh, UCLA and um, Los Angeles Center of Photography, I think eight different classes, many of them with dark skies, I realized LA was just crazy. And we had to drive so far away just to get a dark sky. Even though we travel all over the world uh, with travel photographers, uh, I wanted to be somewhere where every night I could just walk outside literally and shoot the stars and, and the Milky Way or whatever. But, but uh, before we get into the Milky Way and stuff. I just wanted to show you. There's the moon itself right there. Mm -hmm. uh, things like this. You know, I just did two workshops in New York City, and the beauty after lights go down is amazing. So for me, the night sky is the night sky. Anytime it's after dark, I shoot a lot from helicopters. It's just exciting. I have a lot of things that I love to shoot. I've been shooting since I was ten, but for some reason, I'm so drawn to after dark, which includes, of course, the night sky. But this is after dark because you can see the lights are going on all over the place. Um, let's talk about, let's talk about lightning. Um, lightning is an aspect of after dark photography, even though I shoot it a lot. Th this is the comb also. Um, this, this is just the beauty of Sedona right here. It's just so, so gorgeous. This is Sedona from above. This is what it looks like when you have lightning over Sedona. Mm -hmm. I, I just, uh, it's just a special thing about shooting after dark. Uh, you know, I do workshops in Cape Cod, you shoot me in lighthouses, but it's all because of after dark and the night sky. Here in Sedona, we got the Neowise Comet right over the beauty of downtown. Oh, yeah. And there's another great aspect yeah. is shooting the Aurora Borealis, you know, in Iceland. Yeah, yeah. So cool. And you do the same kind of exposure you do for a regular night sky image. Um, this was just really wild. It's world right there. And then we get into star trails and the Milky Way. So all of that was fun stuff I looked for. But then when you want to concentrate on the night sky, uh, this was on my friend's roof. And I could figure out exactly where Polaris is going to be, uh, exactly actually the, the uh, angles of the star trails. And I know exactly where the galactic equator will be and what kind of curvature. So when I'm shooting, I use a program called Photopills. When I'm looking through, I can tell exactly the direction of the star trails so that I know where to set up my camera. So this entire shot here was in my mind. I knew exactly what I wanted before I shot it. Camera was on the roof for about six hours, getting all of these in and putting it together in Photoshop. Death Valley, the same place where we shot the, the uh, lightning. This is facing the other way. That yellow glow is from Las Vegas. And I knew the direction of the star trails would be like this because any, any way you point the camera, you're gonna get different looking star trails. So it's kind of fun. This was in Tuscany. I knew I wanted to get the galactic equator, which is between the north and the southern hemisphere. You'll see kind of straight here, even though it's not perfectly straight. I tweaked it a little bit. And then in the middle of my shooting, I got a huge meteor right here, which yeah. is uh, totally unexpected. Meteor in the middle of my star trails. But this is the Grove in Tuscany, one of my favorite, favorite places to shoot. So this is what it's like when we're shooting okay. the Milky Way around the world is, um, setting up the shoot the Milky Way, and this is what you end up with, stuff like this. So yeah. I look for great locations around the world because it's one thing to just wake up and see the Milky Way. It's another thing to plan to shoot the Milky Way. And this is in front of Courthouse Rock here in Sedona. Everybody, I'm shooting them from behind. This is what we end up with. Really cool shot with the Milky Way, sometimes with light painting. This has moonlight and light painting and light from the village of Oak Creek hitting Courthouse Rock there. Yeah. This is in the Palouse. You could see over my friend's barn right there another friend's barn with the Milky Way. So this is just showing you different places around the world. It's one thing just to see it. Like I walk out my front door, I can see the Milky Way here, but it's another thing to plan that. Coming home from the Wapaki Ruins in Flagstaff, I stopped and the Milky Way was right in front of the road. I put my tripod right in front of the headlamps wow. and I shot this. Yeah, oh, so I had light wonderful. from my headlamps on the road yeah. And I had my friend turn off my headlights, but then I kept like a longer exposure on here. It was like, I call this the twilight zone right here. Mm -hmm. um, the, right here, this is Cathedral Rock in Sedona. This is Bell Rock and Courthouse right here. And this is my, my flashlight, light painting in the foreground here. So this is without moonlight. And then this is with moonlight right here this is from the other side. So this is uh, just kind of fun. We have the reflecting pools up there in the same place, which is kind of fun. The Oak Creek River runs right through town, and I decided to sneak into uh, to uh, the park and shoot them up the way over over the creek. 
Yeah. I, I came up with an idea for self-portrait. So this is our mountain bike course here in Sedona. It's really cool. Oh, look at that one. Totem pole. Um, <clears throat> I'd never done this. I hadn't seen many people do this. I went to Totem Pole and I planned when the Milky Way would be right over Totem Pole in Monument Valley. And on the left here, you can see there's my flashlight so I could light up some of the ground before we did that. And Wapaki Runes with a flashlight. And it's just kind of cool. The Katy National Park is one of my favorite places to be. <clears throat> Back in Sedona. And then Oregon, I'm going to be there in a couple of weeks. Um, anyway, and this is one of my favorite places in the world. It's called Secret Beach. <clears throat> this is in Oregon. I'm going to be shooting this in a matter of weeks. Actually, I'm leaving on the 22nd. Look at that. That's paradise for the Milky Way. Wow. It is just unbelievable. And then more of a uh, Katy National Park. Bottom of uh, Arizona is Bisbee. And it's a beautiful yeah. place to shoot the, the Milky Way. And then we'll end up with yeah. another Milky Way panorama here over our beautiful red rock. So sorry if that took too long, but it's this, it's so fun showing after dark images. Yeah. Anyway. Well, Scott, right. absolutely uh, stunning photography. And uh, we knew that about you and we're so excited. <laughs> to, we're so excited to have you come on. I'm looking forward to the time where you can have a full two hours uh, coming up in December. Oh, yeah, that's going to yeah. be a visual treat. Yeah, yeah. And your stories are fun. And it ties so in. I, it's wonderful that you're able to end with that amount of, of capture of what's happening with Milky Way, with the stars, with the night sky, so that we yeah. can lead right into John and, and John's presentation Thank so today. Much. Thank yeah. you so much today, Scott. For sure. that. And you've also shown us that you know the lights at night i mean they're glorious too yeah but we have to find that balance between lights for safety lights yeah. for drama lights just because we can and what it's doing to our to our sky so hi john hi john Thanks <laughs> good for morning today. hi paul yeah. hi laura yeah so I, I have to know why astronomy and why are you so passionate that you have devoted a segment of your career to advocating to keep our skies dark what is your personal mission? Well, my mission is to enable people all over the world to have this experience of seeing the night sky, of having this sort of firsthand contact with the cosmos, as it were, for some of the same reasons that you identified at the top about the, the longstanding relationship between humans and the night sky and how it inspires people. Um, it's one of the few things that we all have in common as human beings. Um, you know, there's not... There's not an American night sky and a Chinese night sky and a Russian night sky. There's one night sky and it belongs to all of humanity. And my hope in the long run is that it inspires people to want to know more about science in general, um, whether they just educate themselves as consumers and voters or whether you know younger people pursue careers in science. Um, I, we're approaching a crossroads in the history of the planet and we're going to need people who have that kind of, of mindset to help solve some very big problems that we're confronted with. So in a roundabout way, it's to try to, to get people to pay attention to nature and hopefully to try to save it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we, we have to also realize we don't exist just humans being on this planet. We're part of an entire web of life and everything's uh, impacted. We're the caretakers, right? We're one of the ones that have the most influence. So, um, well, tell us about your work with um, consulting. Who do you consult? I, I was so intrigued. The European Federation, they're onto it. Uh, national parks, municipalities. I mean, every, we're all stakeholders in the night sky. Tell us a little bit about the scope of your work, if you would. Sure. Uh, I work with, as you suggest, uh, all manner of, of uh, organizations and particularly government up to, to different levels. Um, a lot of municipal governments, even right here in Arizona, Scott just showed a, a picture of Bisbee. I was just down there a couple of weeks ago uh, trying to help get through some changes to their outdoor lighting ordinance, for example. So uh, you're in the area around Sedona, um, Village of Oak Creek. Those are towns that were certified by the International Dark Sky Association as international dark sky communities. And Bisbee eventually wants to, to become a dark sky community as well. So there's a lot of prep work that goes into that. Uh, dealing with the lighting policy is an important piece. I have a lot of experience with that in my background. Besides astronomy, um, government and law and politics, uh, something that have always been interesting to me. So merging that with the science, uh, that's an outlet for that, that kind of activity. Um, and then I deal with, with private clients as well who have lighting issues on their property that they are dealing with uh, or uh, disputes with neighbors. Um, I'll show you, I have just a, a few images to show 
uh, some examples of what that looks like. What you know, what moves people to want to do something about this problem? And in a lot of cases, it's it's from firsthand experience because they they're dealing with a lighting installation uh, outside at night that's bad in one form or another. Um, so it's a little bit of conservation. It's some public policy work. Uh, a lot of public relations. We're still educating the world about this subject, um, bringing people up to speed and hopefully making them care about it because I think that's the way that we ultimately get to a solution. People have to care about this issue. Mm -hmm. And um, I appreciate Scott's beautiful images of the full on uh, night sky and its full glory, but so many of us don't get to see that view. Right. And so can you show us, you're going to show us some contrasting what most people see. And what is the t statistic? I've heard that, what is it, 80% of school children today may spend their entire lives deprived of the view of even the Milky Way. Right. So what are the statistics around this? So, so much. It's pretty, it's, yeah, it's pretty stark. It depends somewhat on where you live in the world. Obviously, there are, are vast parts of the world that are still fairly dark. Um, but more often than not, that points to the level of economic development of people who live there. You can see in my background here, the, the image is called the Black Marble, was made by NASA using satellite data over the course of about a year. This, they, they need to update this. This is from 2016, so it's changed since then. But they took a year's worth of satellite data and they pulled out all of the nights where the sky was clear over a particular part of the world and then they stitched that together so mm. it gives you the impression as if it's if it's night simultaneously everywhere in the world mm -hmm. and there's not a cloud in the sky anywhere and the the continents are outlined a, a little bit lighter compared to the ocean because of moonlight falling mm. on them the main thing i like to point out here behind me is africa Right. We understand why, you know, why does the United States light up brightly or, or Europe or places like that? And of course, a lot of people live there, but we also consume a lot of electricity and we have a lot of light. There are a billion people here in sub-Saharan Africa. And Africa is not brightly lit because there aren't people living there. It's because their uh, economic development level is not the same as it is. So it's telling us a little bit about the way people live in different parts of the world. But if you, if you look at the big picture, um, about something like 90% of people in the world are impacted at some level by light pollution. It's obviously a bigger number, uh, you know, it tends to be a bigger number here in North America, Europe, Japan, India, places like that. Um, and a good fraction of that number uh, are people who are living in a state of what I would call perpetual twilight in the sense that their night sky never becomes fully dark at night. So if you've ever been out on a, on a moonlit night, Scott showed some pictures uh, uh, that were illuminated by moonlight, you have a sense of how bright that light is. And it's enough to wash out some of the stars in the, the sky. Um, imagine that every night, night after night, regardless of what the moon is doing, you never achieve that complete darkness, what we would call astronomical darkness, uh, because of the, the glow of city lights. And that's impacting uh, a, a huge fraction of the number of people who live in the world. Yeah. Um, and also they advise, if you really want to get a good night's sleep, darken your room. That night is important for our circadian rhythms, for deep sleep, for, I mean, we're biologically tuned um, to, to, to nature. The more we disrupt it, the more we're disrupting our, ourselves and our health. Um, do you yes, absolutely. To show, I'd like to see the contrast between what sure. Scott showed us and then what the typical view in a, a city is. Sure. It's startling. And as you said, it's not even an inky black sky. It's more of a grayed out sky that we see. Um, exactly. And I'm going to start with, uh, by the way, these are not my photos. I am not a photographer like Scott. So I have taken these from different places and I've given credit to, to where I've taken them. Um, but I just want to show you some of the uh, the aspects of this problem as it impacts the night sky. And then the last couple of slides talk about what's going on here on the ground that's contributing to this problem. Uh, so some of your viewers may recognize this constellation. Uh, this is two views of the same constellation. This is Orion, the hunter, which is a familiar figure in the northern hemisphere uh, in the fall and the winter months. Yeah, one of the constellations, yeah. There, there, we were talking about heroes at the top, right? This is sort of the original. And this is a, a collection of stars 
that um, most cultures in the world have seen as a human figure for on the order of probably 20,000 years or more. So this really goes back deep into our history. So this is two views of Orion with exactly the same camera settings and same camera, but taken from two places. One where the sky is very naturally dark is on the left and then in a, a light polluted city environment on the right. Uh, to just give you a sense of how much is lost as a result of all of this, uh, what we call sky glow. And just to be uh, clear on what that is, the reason that the image on the right is washed out is because light on the ground is going up into the night sky. It's scattering off of the components of the atmosphere. So very small dust particles, air molecules, et cetera. And some of that light is coming back down to the ground. So all of that light in the image on the right that makes that background, that kind of grayish green mm -hmm. is actually light on the ground. So to the extent that the sky looks like that on the right, it's a reflection of sorts of what's happening on the ground. So that's, I wanted to, to make that clear that that's the problem that we're dealing with in this case. What does that look like if we consider the entire sky? So these are two views of the night sky. Um, one is from um, a nature park in Austria, which is on the left. And the view on the right is towards the city of Linz. So now you're getting towards that city light. These are fisheye lens images. So you set up a camera with a particular kind of lens that has a very wide field of view. You point it at the zenith, which is the top of the sky. And so the zenith is in the center and the horizon runs around the edge. So you can see the silhouettes of, of trees and buildings and things on the horizon. Uh, and at the center is if you were looking straight up. So these are just a way of representing the entire sky in one image. You're and again, this is to show. I mean, you would barely right. See it. It's it's there. You can sense that it's there on the right, but it's not nearly as prominent as it is on the left. And then you're seeing around the horizon, around that edge, you're starting mm -hmm. to see that glow. And in in the the, the nature park image on the left, the, the cities and towns are fairly far away, and so that glow is very low to the horizon. But as you approach the city in the view on the right, that mm -hmm. light is coming up from the horizon and <laughs> making it progressively difficult to see stars. You know, the Milky Way is more visible in that shot in the city by its dark areas than by its bright areas. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And and if you were there, you would barely be able to tell that the uh, it was in the sky. It would be right at the threshold of, of uh, human vision at that wow. point. Wow. Um, so this, the same idea of as you're coming, see, if you're coming down towards the, the, the bottom of that frame on the right, it's getting brighter and brighter and brighter. This is another image that that illustrates that that there are many more stars towards the top of this frame than there are towards the bottom of the frame as you're getting more of that glow. As you're passing through denser layers of air, you're getting more of that light scatter from the city. And that's what's causing the, the stars to disappear. And at, right above the horizon, at that point, they, they pretty much disappear entirely. Uh, down in the corner there in the left, you just can't see any stars in that region that that, that yellow glow is is the brightest. And in this case, the, the glow is also telling us something about the sources of the light. This is mostly sodium lighting. This is from a location in Spain, and it has a very characteristic color to it, which is very different than the color of the stars. Mm -hmm. So that's something that, that jumps out um, as well pretty quickly here. And that's why we don't see the stars during the day, right? We've got scatter of the, the sun. That's right. Washing that's it right. out. The more light you put in the sky, the fewer stars you're going to see. They're, they're competing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. They're competing. This, this cosmic light in the background is competing with this light we put in the foreground that acts like mm -hmm. a veil almost and, and makes it difficult to see what's beyond. If we put clouds on top of this, it gets more complex. You may have seen in some of Scott's photos, there was one of New York City at night looking back across the Brooklyn Bridge and there was some clouds in the sky that were brighter than the sky itself. So here's an example of that. This is outside of the city of Uppsala, Sweden, looking mm -hmm. across a lake and you don't see any stars here at all because there, there are clouds. You wouldn't see them. Mm -hmm. But in a dark place without the city lights, those clouds would be dark. So it would be blacker than the night sky with stars because now the starlight's not making it through. So the clouds are, are doing what we call amplifying this effect. They're making the effect stronger by virtue of being a little bit more opaque rather than the, the, the more thin 
uh, when you just have air, a lot of the light passes through. That's what the satellites see that make images like the one in my background. But if we put some clouds on top of that, it gets a lot brighter. The concern that we have there is that that light coming back down to the ground is also brighter. And the impact on wildlife is a lot more significant when we have this cloud amplification. Mm -hmm. It's like bounce back, right? You just put it, it is a bounce back. It's it, and it's making things stronger. It's a feedback effect almost. Mm -hmm. This is another uh, example of um, clouds amplifying the sky glow. It's a little easier to see what's going on now because the clouds are patchy and now you can see the stars behind them. If this were not near a city, those clouds would be almost as black as the silhouettes of the trees in the foreground oh, because now they're blocking the starlight. So that's an indication right there of the significance of the sky glow is that those clouds are much brighter than the sky background and they're a different color. That's another hint. Hmm. So Scott showed pictures that were more or less like this, these city views at night. This is a, looking over the Los Angeles basin you know, so essentially there, are, uh, I think I see one or two stars in the background. The stars are almost gone at this point. Um, and the, the, what I wanted to show here is the perspective of the photographer is literally from above the city. This is in the, the hills north of Los Angeles. So now you're looking down on the city, but look how many individual sources of light that you can mm -hmm. pick out. Right, That means that some fraction of the light is going directly up into the sky. If that were not the case, you wouldn't see the bright points of light. You would only see the overall glow. So what this is suggesting is what is the source of all of this light that's showing up in the night sky as sky glow? It's light that is wasted. It's, it's directed up into the sky where it doesn't benefit anybody. If we put light in our environments at night for our, our safety, to be able to see or to get around, to enable nighttime commerce, uh, nighttime recreation for a lot of purposes, mm -hmm. um, what this is telling us is that a lot of that light is being wasted because it isn't benefiting anybody. Mm -hmm. And that's suggestive of what the solution to the problem is, which is to just get rid of that waste. If we did that, you would eliminate a lot of the sky glow in this image, but you would provide all the light that people needed on the ground. So you just direct the light down. You just direct the light down. Uh, instead of like here, this is an image from uh, India where you can see on the on the right, that blue source of light behind the trees is mm -hmm. aimed almost directly up. You can see those kind of rays uh, mm -hmm. projecting up into the sky. Uh, and I've, I've talked about the color of the light, the color of the city. You'll notice that that source on the right appears to be a lot stronger than the more red source of light over on the right side of the frame towards, or the left side, excuse me, towards the bottom. The color matters a lot. The blue light scatters very efficiently in our atmosphere. That's the reason that the sky is blue during the daytime and not some other color. Mm -hmm. So light color matters a lot, not only in how it scatters into the night sky, but we know that that blue color uh, very strongly affects wildlife by disrupting circadian rhythm and if you as a human being are exposed to that blue light at night, it will definitely mess with your sleep. So in addition to keeping that light aimed down, we also need to pay attention to uh, what color that light is yeah. in the process. Wavelength, yeah. If we have a bright surface on the ground, I talked about how the clouds amplify the, the, uh, the light in the night sky, mm -hmm. uh, a coating of ice or snow on the ground amplifies it further. This is a phenomenon that's come to be called snow glow. And that foreground light, it looks like it's lit up as brightly as day. That's, that's a real effect because of all that light in the sky. So if you have a layer of clouds, you have a layer of snow on the ground, you could find that the conditions around you at night are as high as we've measured around 3000 times higher than under a natural night sky with no snow on the ground. This is a huge effect in places that have uh, snow and ice in the winter. And we can see that in our satellite measurements as cities in cold climates appear to be a lot brighter in the winter, uh, even though in the summer, we don't see nearly as much light coming from them. And a lot of that has to do with these um, surfaces. Well, and um, I imagine the very more, most northern cities where the sun doesn't set at all. Right? So. And they're running their lights 24 hours a day. 
-hmm. Yes, it's it's a significant problem in uh, at the high latitudes for precisely that reason. Um, this is a, a picture just to show you uh, what we would call a light dome over a city. So this is a, a, a fairly dark place where this photograph was taken, um, looking back in the direction of a city that's fairly isolated from others. And you see this kind of um, semicircle appearance or, or almost a hemisphere over that, that distant light source. But if we look above it, we see the stars shining through it pretty well. This is a, an effect that is easy to see if you're out in the country somewhere, you're looking back towards uh, the city maybe where you came from, it'll be isolated like this. So if, if you were to hear me make a reference to a light dome, this is what we're, we're talking about. I've seen a lot um, of those. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so if, you're, if you're up on the rim, for example, looking back towards Phoenix, if you're out here in Arizona, uh, you'll see Phoenix appear very much like this from a distance of maybe 100 miles or more. Um, quite often. Again, the, the black marble, just to illustrate that this is a, a worldwide problem. It's not something that's unique to the West or to industrialized countries. Uh, it's really starting to appear almost anywhere on mm. earth that any number of people <clears throat> live. Um, lastly, and just, just real quick, I want to talk about um, the, where this problem is coming from. And it is situations uh. like this. Mm -hmm. Everybody is familiar with this. You know, here's a, a, a place that's later at night. Um, you know, it, it's a movie theater. They're still open. But if you were to come back at two in the morning when the place is closed, they, they're running their uh, parking lot lights just like this, blasting light in every direction. Um, a lot of that light is wasted. It's either reflecting off the ground. Some of it's growing up directly into the night sky and it's contributing to that problem. Uh, if those lights were properly shielded, if they weren't so intense, they off. wouldn't be, turn them off when people aren't around. These are very simple ideas, right? You know, put the light where you need it, when you need it, the right amount, the right time. If you did that, we would solve this problem overnight. Hmm. Uh, and that's part of the beauty of it is that we have that instant gratification uh, of being able to see the, the, the problem resolve itself very quickly when we make those changes. Well, and the, the very pressure from rising energy costs, California having brownouts. I mean, there's going to be mandates about you must conserve electricity. We will get to that point um, in our society where there's just not enough electricity to go around. So wasting mm. it like this is, is just going to be mandated. Won't that help solve the problem? It, to some extent, although what we've seen, especially in the last decade with the rise of LED lighting is lighting is becoming very energy efficient and so mm. people think in their minds they have this notion that led light is environmentally friendly mm. so that they're less concerned about leaving the lights on all night because they say well it's it's using much less electricity than it was before but part of what we're seeing as a consequence of that mentality is that the world is getting brighter at an accelerated rate because light is now perceived to be cheap okay. yeah. and people are consuming more of it but Laura, to your point, that's exactly what's happening. Um, there is an energy crisis beginning to develop in Europe right now, in part because of the war in Ukraine and shutting off of energy supplies to Europe. Uh, and just as recently as two days ago, for example, the government of Belgium said that it was going to begin shutting off lights in public places during overnight hours as a means of reducing energy consumption. So you're exactly right. It's coming one way or the other in the well, future. As we become more ecologically minded as a planet, we are going to be gentler and leave less of a footprint. So this will just be part of it, our thinking, I, I predict. Right? We hope so, right? We hope so. And, and in the process, the again, we, yeah. we want to ensure that people have enough light to do the things that they do uh, mm -hmm. at night. And we think we can accomplish all of these things without creating a disadvantage to anyone. Um, mostly what people are concerned about at night is their own personal sense of safety and the last two images that i want to show are a pair so i'm going to i'm going to show you this next image i'm going to set this up and then i'm going to show you the contrast mm -hmm. to illustrate my point and that is the ability to see things at night is dependent on more than just how much light you are putting out there so this pair of images in in the world of light pollution has become kind of famous so this is a situation that a lot of us might encounter in the neighborhoods where we live. 
And that's where somebody has a, a bright exterior light on the side of their house. It's lighting up part of their yard. Uh, it's left on all night long. It is mainly there to make the owner of the house feel safe, mm -hmm. knowing that there's a light on and the belief that that's discouraging people from doing nefarious things at night. And so what's going to happen here in the next frame, this is again, same camera, same settings, everything, is the photographer is going to stretch out his hand and he's going to use it to block the light coming from that source, which is equivalent to what we would get if we put a shield on that light. So now the, the light is more aimed down. Mm -hmm. And when he does that, only then do you see the person standing in the open gate. Uh, That's what we mean by nighttime visibility. Mm -hmm. If we reduce the waste, if we didn't have that light blasting in the viewer's eyes, mm -hmm. they would see the thing that is threatening to them potentially. They would see the security risk. So again, all we're after here is making better use of the light that we already have out there with the goal of improving nighttime visibility. And if we did that, the world would be a safer place at night and we wouldn't have nearly as much of the, the light pollution that you've seen in these example images. Okay, so our eyes are a similar screen to the night sky. You flood it with light and you can't see anything, basically. You can't see anything. Yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah, and it's it's this simple, this illustration, mm -hmm. the, the, the hand in the way of the light is a, a, a sort of proxy for dealing with the light a little bit more permanently, putting a shield on it, maybe reducing its intensity, putting it on a timer uh, to where it's only on during the hours when somebody might need it. Uh, if we, again, if we did these things, we could solve this problem quite literally overnight. It's not like other forms of environmental pollution, like air and water pollution, where we might have to wait years after we stop polluting for the system to become clean again. This is an unusual case where the pollutant leaves at the speed of light and we have that sense of instant gratification. It's a matter of education then. It's education. Thank you. Um, scatter effect. So somebody's requesting that you explain more about the scatter because our energy efficient lights are scattering more, creating more of the light pollution than the less energy efficient. So what is the solution there beyond placement and shielding and directing it down? I mean, but what about the type of light and its wavelength? <laughs> What do we do? Yes, that's a that's a great question. And and the, the short answer is those warmer colors are really what you want for a couple of reasons. Um, obviously, the, the as that light gets bluer, like I showed the example where the blue light was, you know, really strongly scattering and you had those very, you know, high contrast beams going up to the night sky. Um, that's that's what's going to give us the, the strongest effect with the sky glow. It's most uh, difficult for the environment. Um, but the other thing is a lot of that light is not even useful to the human eye. So if you think about the way our eyes work at night, everybody's familiar with this effect that they sometimes call night vision, where the longer you stay outside under darkness or even, in, even inside in a dark place, as you wait a few minutes and a little wait a little longer, you're able to see fainter and fainter and fainter things. And as that's happening, your sensitivity to color is changing at the same time, and it's shifting more to the blue, mm -hmm. which means that when you put blue light into the, the environment at night, you get bigger bang for your buck. You can use a little bit of blue light, and it goes a long way. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that mostly when people have been putting in LEDs, for example, it's been a one-to-one -one trade. They're putting in the same quantity of light that they had before, but they're shifting the color out to the blue. And that's where it appears that we get these complaints when people see the new street light going up outside and they say, why is that light so much brighter than it was before? Mm -hmm. And in fact, it isn't. But our eyes are telling us that it is because of this shift in sensitivity that's taking place. So we would actually do better with the kind of bright lights we use now if we would shift them all to these warmer colors. Mm -hmm. We would be putting light in that's, that's giving us more of a visual response yeah. under bright lighting conditions and mm -hmm. doing less harm to the environment. Okay, two questions. So can you put like a red shield or a, a, like a filter, like a color over the light? Does that change it? And the next question is when we go to star parties, the only lights they let you have are red. 
So you have to use red filters over your flashlights just to see to get to the giant telescopes and climb up and peer through them because they don't want you to buzz your eyes out so that you can't mm -hmm. see. You're protecting your own acuity of your eyesight by just seeing red light and very little of it to, to go see. Uh, you don't want to blast your eyes so that you can't see um, through the telescope. Right. So right. That's, how does that's that dark work? adaptation. Dark. Okay. Yes. So dark how, adaptation. How, you have is, two kinds of cells in your eyes, basically. Okay. You have the cells that um, function under bright lighting conditions like daylight and are good at telling you colors. Mm -hmm. um, they're not great at um, low light situations which is why you may have noticed if you're in a dark room or you're outdoors and it's dark, colors just don't seem as vivid. Yeah. Um, and it's because as you begin to adapt to those lower light levels, those color sensing bright light cells are starting to drop off in their function. And another type of cell is taking over that doesn't give you any color information at all, but it's really good at sensing low light and it's good at sensing movement in mm -hmm. low light. And if you think about the, you know, the way we evolved, we're really not nighttime creatures. No. We're daytime creatures. And so, you know, we, all we needed to be able to do at night was to avoid the big predators, you know, out on the African savanna that were trying to eat us. So all we needed to do was see them moving in low light situations. Um, and that's where that shift is taking place to, to being more sensitive to, to bluer light sources, because it turns mm -hmm. out the natural sources of light in the night sky, uh, moonlight, you know, other sources that you would, would have experienced in nature are more blue on average than the daytime light sources that we're exposed to. So that's where that shift is taking place. And under low light conditions, those very light sensitive cells, they're not really sensitive to red light at all. That's when those color sensing cells are kicking in again. So that's how they put you under the red light to, to, so to give you enough light to see around to trigger those daytime color sensing cells, mm -hmm. but leaving the sensitivity of the faint light cells alone. So then you can look up in the night sky and still see the Milky Way, for example. As to filtering that light, which is a, a great way of um, modifying, if you have a, a light source, it's not great. You can modify its output with a color filter. That right. works great. The only caveat is make sure that if you put a filter on a lighting product that it's approved by a manufacturer and really don't make any modification to a light unless it's a, a, a product that's a, you know made available by the manufacturer or is an approved use only in that it's if it's not designed for that and you change for example the the thermal balance inside of a light fixture oh. you run the risk of shorting it out it could catch yeah. fire yeah. etc so just from a safety perspective, make sure that you know, what you, whatever you're doing to your light source is approved by the manufacturer. And also protecting your eyes, right? You're wearing orange tinted glasses to stare at your screen, or you've got the blue light filtering screens on your um, screens on your screens. Or your eyeglasses. Uh, filters yes. on your screens, yeah. So, I mean, those are important because you're putting a bunch of light in and it's fatiguing. I, I went out uh, with friends who had military grade uh, light, uh, yeah, binoculars, light, binoculars, right. To see, it's fatiguing to your eyes, whatever mm -hmm. you're throwing into your eyes. Right. So right. it's, it's, you've got to protect these eyes as well. Yes. Right? I mean, the, the health, the health light. implications is, is are, significant. Yeah. Are significant. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. night predators, nature has evolved night predators to see in the dark. So their eyes are going to be adapted to those light frequencies, right? Nature's been very clever about putting us with the equipment that we need to do the jobs we're meant on earth to do. Right. So. Absolutely. And then, it, then when we are, we're kind of forcing the issue a bit and extending mm -hmm. our active hours into the evening in a way that is really yeah. not compatible with our evolution. And go. we're starting to see the effects of that. Um, yeah. uh, Lori, you mentioned sort of the, the, the physiological concerns about all of that light that we're staring at at night. Um, Bright light, bright blue light in particular, is not only disruptive to the circadian rhythm and will will um, make your sleep more difficult, mm -hmm. but there are some laboratory studies in animals that have shown that over time, sustained exposure to high levels of blue light will actually damage the cellular machinery of the eye, in part because it generates a lot of these free radicals that you hear about, oh, uh, th this oxidative stress. 
-hmm. So you'd really be doing yourself a favor to either cut down your light consumption tonight, or like you suggested, wearing the blue blockers, the, the orange glasses, mm -hmm. just to cut the blue light out would mm -hmm. be better for your eyes. Or turn down the brightness of your screen. And, you know, I think it's called cataracts, yeah. right? When you're, when you're, cornea, whatever gets oxidated. Yeah. So yeah, protect your eyes. Also, um, Eminem was asking the question, when you purchase outdoor light fixtures, what, what, what are you looking for in terms of the name of a feature that would help prevent some of this unnecessary light? Is it even advertised? Is there a way to know what to buy? Yeah, and, and I, would, I would recommend that people have a look at the International Dark Sky Society or Association's website, which is darksky.org. They have a program called the Fixture Seal of Approval. So mm -hmm. what IDA has done is it comes up with a list of criteria for lighting products that are friendly to the night sky. They're shielded. They're directed down when they're installed correctly. They're, you know, no more than a certain brightness. And importantly, with this color business, they're limited in the amount of blue light that they're emitting. So you can look at their website and see a list of products that meet that uh, set of criteria. Mm -hmm. um, and the manufacturers that participate in that program can put IDA service mark right on their packaging. So you can pick up a, go to a home improvement store, pick up a, a box with lighting equipment in it off the shelf, look for the International Dark Sky Association label on it. And you'll know that it's, it's been listed in this program because it meets those criteria for dark sky friendliness. If you're looking at a box and it doesn't have the IDA label on it, the things that you want to look for are some sort of shielding around the outside that is opaque, yeah. not a, a translucent or, or transparent cover, like a glass cover, but something that's opaque. And they'll usually show a photo of the light in context. So mounted on a wall, for example. And if that light is mounted with the light going down, you know that that's the kind of product that you, you really want. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, there's the box, a little... Uh, information box on all new lighting sold in the United States. It's called Lighting Facts. And on that Lighting Facts label, there is a number that tells you the, the color of the light. They've expressed it as a number. And it's a number in the few thousand. And you want to look for lighting that's 3,000 or less. Okay. As that number gets bigger, 4,000, 5,000 and above, you're now getting into light that has so much blue in it that it begins to resemble daylight. And you want to avoid that at night at all costs. Mm -hmm. So one thing that Scotty's beautiful images showed us was that lighting at night in our cities, on our buildings, in our, uh, in our life is really beautiful. And so it's not about eliminating light. It's about intelligently utilizing the light so that we can find a happy medium between lighting our way at night and uh, and enjoying the the stars. So um, yeah, yeah, I appreciate I appreciate Scott that you showed us really what how beautiful our our night lights are. Um, but it, it's finding that balance, and I think um, I'd like to hear from Tony Hall, well, Tony who's got it. some great stories about helping neighbors understand the impact of too bright of lights at night that are unnecessary. And Tony, I think you've got some very good stories on that to share, that we can all be advocates for our environment for this. Yeah, well, first of all, you see what T-shirt I'm wearing. Uh, <laughs> Protect the night. Uh, I'm, I'm an astronomer, and uh, when I first went to Kitt Peak, the National Observatory southwest of Tucson, I was amazed by how beautiful the sky was. That was 1976. Hmm. Ten years later, when I went there, the Dome of Phoenix, had expanded by a factor of five from what it was before. It was like a quarter of the sky had been taken away from, from uh, the National Observatory. And that made me feel this in a very, very uh, visceral way. Uh, like uh, even, even a place like the National Observatory is not safe. Well, one of the things I'm, I am concerned about, and, um, and there's quite a bit of dialogue in the astronomical community about, is um, the this is what you were talking about, the color temperature of light, and perhaps the most efficient diode lighting is on the blue end in terms of the most lumens per watt. And I think we're looking at the law of unexpected consequences that cities and other people think, oh, we're doing a good thing. We're decreasing our carbon footprint, not realizing that they're totally uh, destroying the night sky. Mm -hmm. and, and so this is a very serious thing. 
Um, to my dismay and horror, I was in Costco on Wednesday, and they have a huge display with two different sets of lights, and they're showing them shining up diode light shining up at houses, making them look like castles. Don't you want to buy these at, at, at a very affordable prices? And I, I don't know uh, if the IDA wants to get involved at all. And as a member of Costco, I'm, I'm planning to write a letter. I can yeah. Take, but, yeah. but this is exactly the sort of thing that we don't want, but they think they're doing something nice. In terms of stories, uh, a couple of quick stories. There was a large, gravel mine in the town I live in, which is in the mountains north of Albuquerque. And they had equipment, bulldozers and stuff at night. It's a fairly safe place, but nevertheless, they felt it important to put a huge amount of, of light on the bulldozers and stuff like that when they were not being used. Oh. And people a mile away were saying they could read their newspaper at midnight by walking out front mm -hmm. with all the scattered light. Um, I was part of a committee led a committee that went to talk to the uh, the person who ran the facility. He had no idea. That night, the lights were turned off and never put on again. Mm -hmm. uh, Probably I had, a, yeah. uh, I had a similar situation with a neighbor of mine uh, who um, all of a sudden, I'm up on top of the hill, and in the valley below, this huge light was shining up, pretty much destroying any night adaptation if you look to the east. And it was very annoying. I went down and talked to him. Again, no idea. He thought he was protecting his chickens from coyotes and that he could really do a lot to suppress the light. And he did. So uh, it, it's a matter, I think, I think of chickens education. Chickens are happier too, Tony. <laughs> yeah, probably. But it's also a matter of education, I think. Um, uh, and the IDA, I, I can't endorse it too much. And I really appreciate John's comments. And while Scott's pictures are beautiful, a lot of them are part of the problem that we saw tonight. These beautiful city uh, cityscapes are totally ruining the sky over over hundreds of miles of uh, distance even. It's really, um, uh, we have to be aware of that. Um, um, it's, it's, it doesn't come for free. We're paying a huge price on that. And even though the pictures are beautiful, I agree with that totally. Uh, the effect on the night sky, we're, we're selling out that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I wanted to comment on those things and, and thank everybody for your patience on this. Um, but this is something I feel strongly, and I really appreciate John's comments, as I do Scott's beautiful pictures. Uh, but my little caution is uh, beware, beware of, of, of um, ambient lighting, particularly when it looks up. Beware of diode lighting. Uh, talk to your, talk to your um, politicians, the people who make decisions about lighting. And, uh, and I, I guess one question I have for John, and that's, the impression I have is that enforcement of dark sky ordinances are weak. Is there any way we can um, up the ante on that when we need to? Uh, as I say, my experience of talking to people has been good, but uh, again, um, that doesn't always work. Mm. Yeah, and what is the enforcement? What is the teeth for a, a, a community mm -hmm. to, to ensure well, there, there may be rules, but how to get the police out even to deal with it is another matter. Yeah. Or a committee. I don't yeah. think it needs the police, but it needs education and well, a committee and some kind of enforcement. Yeah. Well, if you have enforcement, you need the police. Yeah. Okay. Um, I also want to say that Table Mountain is a star party annually that happened in eastern Washington when right. we were right. Seattleites. And th now they've had to move that. They've had to move because of the glow, even in eastern Washington. Oh, the... uh, they had to move closer to the Canadian border. So they used to go to a beautiful tabletop mountain, used to be on a no moon night, you could really see some stars. Yeah. They've had to move yeah. the location because of that of like gathering. Spokane and Seattle or something being, yeah. Yeah, hmm. even that. That reflection. Uh, John? John. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Tony, you, you kind of put your finger on it. Uh, the enforcement side of lighting ordinances has been a problem for a long time. Um, you also put your finger on what I think is the underlying um, means of making that better, which is um, engagement with people, raising awareness of the problem. The examples that you gave were ones where the owner of the offending light really kind of didn't realize the right. harm that it was causing. 
And when that was pointed out, and this has been my experience, oftentimes people are very receptive to making changes if they come to believe that they're creating a problem for their neighbors. That's obviously not going to be universally the case, but in, in many situ situations it will be. Um, a, as a matter of you know, getting code enforcement to come out and write people's citations, that's the stick end of the carrot and the stick, and nobody wants to be involved in it. The cities don't want to do it. They don't want to intervene in, in neighbor disputes. Um, I, I think the solution at the end of the day is two things. One is do more of your enforcement on the upfront side. So when new construction is going in or when people are renovating their properties, that's a good time. If they need building permits, you can put all kinds of conditions on, on getting permits. That obviously won't solve the problem of what's already out there. Retiring those lights comes back to this sense of awareness and building community support for these ideas. And if it's crafted and presented in the right way, I think the message becomes engaging. And if it gets people to just think about what they're doing, in many cases, what I've heard people say in reactions, they say, oh, I had no idea. I didn't know I was part of the problem. And far more often than not, they're willing to do something about it. But that's also an investment of time and, and energy. And in many communities, it'll take many years to, to, uh, to pay off. Um, but more often than not, when people start to make those investments, they start to see improvements. Mm -hmm. so I doubt that, uh, that Paris will ever put out the lights on the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> not probably not the Eiffel Tower, but you know, France has one of I, what I think is yeah. one of the best national light pollution laws in the world. Yeah. And the Eiffel Tower is not what worries me. It's the many, many tens of thousands of shop windows, for example. Uh, absolutely. I was being facetious. That has to be off now. Yeah. 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 It's oh. shocking that they light up the Egyptian pyramids at night, right? That mm. that was shocking. Um, I want to also say that, okay, so in in our little town, a new hotel goes up and the designer creates neon lights all around the hotel. Boy, did this community shut that down as in protesting, newspaper articles, big to do. So the hotel just turned them off. But I'm amazed that the building codes didn't say, you know, there's an ordinance here. This is a dark sky community. This isn't going to pass even in the design or how, how, how that got past the building codes. Can we enforce it on that level? Or how master gardeners are in every community to help the novices come out, educate you, advise you, help you do this. I mean, why isn't there a kind of a master lighting community for dark skies? I mean, Lots of giants involved citizens, in that, yeah. yeah, but I mean, come, please come, advise me on how to do this because I'm clueless right. and I don't know what to buy or how to do this. Couldn't there be citizen committees to go out mm -hmm. and and help those who are asking for it? I mean, there could be a lot of interface to rather than be sick on because somebody's complaining, but to mm. reach out and go, hey, come and help me do this right because I don't have time to learn and, and go shop. Or maybe you mentioned Costco, Tony, um, how Costco has, hey, buy this heat pump or buy this and they've got you know, oh. yeah, you could go dark sky lighting, um, <laughs> sign they up, yeah, and yeah. then somebody could sell you the right parts and pieces. And it, there, there's ways that we can interface. I think it. just just education and so. bringing it to people's attention because it it really hasn't been well distributed in terms of, of yeah. everybody Why having. Why isn't this in my local newspaper? It. So that Coming is a community in, dialogue, yeah. Yeah. right? A question for John. Um, how would you recommend I approach, I approach Costco? Obviously, I'm annoyed, uh, but I, I, I think I would do it in a rational way and and talk and just show them the pictures they're showing and saying, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. How can you be doing um, this? Fundamentally, uh, Tony, I think probably the best way to do it is to find who their corporate sustainability officer is and make an appeal to their corporate values. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I'm sure they're they're wanting to put a good face on their corporate citizenship and say, look at all the great things we're doing. We're you know, we're doing this and that for energy efficiency at right. our stores. We're doing like, recycling. And like then my that. question is, if your parking lot lighting is terrible or you're selling lighting in your stores that is illegal in the jurisdiction you're selling it in, mm -hmm. which right. is often the case, you can do better and you should. 
-hmm. bringing a, a little a little perfect. tiny bit of shame to the situation that's sometimes that's perfect. is motivating to people yeah. were you able yeah. to do that with the movie theater you had a picture of yeah not not in that particular case but in others uh to to not to necessarily make a, a good example but uh some time ago at ida we got through to the the sustainability officer at walmart for example and they have now changed the standard lighting plan for new stores, no matter where they are built in the country. And they're getting a lot better. We have some examples right here in Tucson of, of lighting in their parking lots. It's just excellent. And they did it as much as for the reasons of we're saving more money because we're using less electricity. We're improving the the actual lighting in the parking lots in the process, so we're getting good customer feedback. Right, it's a win win win. That's how you've got to sell it: is that the doing the right thing won't cost you any more. And to your point a minute ago about how those high color temperature, very blue looking LEDs are the ones that get the best energy efficiency. As time has gone by, the playing field is being leveled. And now you can get essentially the same energy efficiency with those warmer lights. Mm -hmm. So now it's just an aesthetic choice. It's no longer the case. There's nobody in corporate America that can tell me, well, we, we have to put up those bluer lights because they get 2% more energy efficiency. They can't say that to me with a straight face anymore right. because it doesn't have the impact of when it was a 20% difference. Mm. So it's only a 2% difference? One or two percent at most. Mm. It's in the noise. Oh. So, yes, it's a, a choice what a now. What price we're paying for that? Yeah. But besides, everybody looks better with warmer lights, right? Mm. <laughs> this is what the yes. sun gives us—kind of a yellow glow <laughs> rather than a sickly blue. Um, uh, but go, go, let me just. But quick... also, green is the new gold, right? Green is the new gold, and you're also going to win the support of your community. You're going to um, be on the side of the planet. That's a huge corporate enticement, right there. Yeah. What were you going to say? Well, before Tony logs off, I just wanted to honor Tony for a moment, just being the astronomer and astrophysicist that has been consulting us and giving us guidance even to have this interview today. And we've also been talking about the impact of satellites he's been telling us about and what's going to happen in the next 10 years. Next week, we're interviewing Tony. He's going to be, our, he's going to be one of three astronomers that are coming on our program to talk specifically about the what's happening with the James Webb Telescope, but a continuation. And the glorious new images coming yeah, in, yeah. joined by. Um, so thank you, Tony. I wanted to. I, yeah. oh, oh, let's get on to uh, what you just mentioned, which is the satellites. Tony, you've been saying for a long time that for 5G, for connectivity, that's a good thing. Starlink. But look at the price we're yeah. paying, and that every now every country wants to put their own flotilla of uh, satellites in the in the air. We're going to have more satellites than we will stars. Um, yeah, yeah. I would, this point. is actually a, a huge problem. You know, SpaceX is planning to put 10,000, I know how many it is, I probably should not mention that, new satellites up. The other two major billionaire space uh, entities are doing the same. Yeah. A large number. And Europe is responding because they don't want to be depending on our GPS and our um, and our uh, 5G, and the same is happening in the Orient and probably in Russia. Uh, it is said that in a decade, a child may look up at the sky and wonder what is that satellite that's not moving, mainly mm -hmm. as far, if they can see anything at all, uh, apropos of John's discussion. But this is certainly, um, certainly an issue. Um, astronomical imagery is almost invariably streaked with satellites now. Uh, particularly wide field imaging imagery and it's uh we're seeing a lot of debris we're going to see more and more collisions it's uh it, so it's, uh, it's a it's a interesting down on us at some point well it, it'll burn up so so that's not so much yeah. of a concern but when it's up there if you have a collision you know one satellite might make a thousand pieces of, of debris or ten thousand which would act uh, as as uh, shrapnel to get the next satellite Etc. So there's a cascading effect, which uh, could mean we'll have a whole belt of, uh, of nasty little pieces of satellites that are not going to want to come down for a long time. 
And this discussion yeah. of the trying to come up with ways to blacken out the satellites, not to reflect light so much. I don't know whether that's having any impact. Uh, what, what's it happening does. with that? It does. And I have to give Elon Musk uh, credit for that. He is working at having the, the Earth side of all the satellites he's doing uh, blackened. Ah. Uh, unlike, unlike Sputnik, which was the size of a basketball, and it was, but it was uh, gold plated. And so it was very bright for those of us old enough to have seen Sputnik in, in 57. <laughs> yeah. It used to yeah. be a novelty to see a satellite. Yeah, yeah. Nearby. All right. Yeah. Your well, thoughts on that, John? You want to add to that? Oh, certainly. Uh, and, and what Tony said is correct. There is has been some effort to try to change the satellite designs to make them a little bit darker. Um, they have already run into a wall with that at SpaceX, because as you darken a surface, you absorb more heat from sunlight and eventually you start to cook the electronics inside the satellite. So there's that you get to diminishing returns. They've also tried in the last couple of years putting little tiny sunshades on the satellites that would block some of the sunlight uh, while giving a clear view of the earth for communications. And that works to darken them even further but then they found that the little sunshades interfered with uh, laser communication links between the satellites. Oh, so they seem to have abandoned that. And now the latest that we've heard is that they're going to uh, do some experiments with putting um, a kind of a film onto the surface that has almost a prismatic effect to it and redirects the light away from the Earth without warming the interior of the satellite. So it may well turn out to be that this idea of, of further innovation in engineering will bring down the, the brightness, but we're weighing that against just the sheer number of objects. There very well could be 100,000 satellites in orbit around the Earth at the end of this decade. For reference, there's about 6,000 of them right now. Oh. And as Tony said, the, the potential for small pieces of debris to be generated by these satellites colliding with each other is is tremendous we're we're seeing just as we've seen a transformation of the earth's environment in the last 200 years or so we're seeing a transformation of the space environment now that is completely unprecedented a hundred thousand will we see any stars anyway or are they just going to be continually whizzing by we don't know yet yeah, and also, who owns this guy? We're all stakeholders in this guy, but who says who gets to put stuff up there? <laughs> These are private companies getting to put this stuff up there. Uh, and, and does the geopolitical situation uh, forestall a cooperative collection mm -hmm. of sharing? What you said is it's geopolitical, and it, it's yeah. a very complex thing with, with powerful entities and a lot of lobbying involved. And how do you get... Uh, the Europeans to have the same opinion as, as our our people, and oh, even our, even even our legislators are, are confused. They don't know how to deal with this. Yeah. Uh, Michael Enoch is on, and he is involved a lot in putting satellites into space. Now, a NASA or another satellite, something that has utility of that kind, has to have collision avoidance on it. And uh, I don't know yeah, if Michael will comment about that, but but this is beginning to become a big issue where. Uh, somehow you have to track all these things, and if you have, you, you know, if you have space station or you manned space particularly, but even a scientific satellite like Hubble, you don't want a, a few of these communication satellites to uh, mm. to take out Hubble, for example. Yeah. Web, we don't have to worry about so much. <laughs> oh, 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 reach. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh it's, it's my. A hundred thousand. Yeah. There's only what six thousand visible stars, and we're going to get a hundred thousand satellites. Mm -hmm. So you're going to look up in the sky, and that's all you're going to see are satellites. Well, unless if they come up, star. unless if they can control every, the lighting and reflectivity. Every now and then, every now and then, you may see a star, unless unless we uh, keep on putting blue diode lights uh, up in, in huge uh, wattages or huge yeah, yeah. moons. This is why this is a serious topic, and that's what I was saying at the beginning of today's introduction, and that is is that I have to admit, I didn't understand the significance behind what's going on and how you know, there's so much attention on environmental issues, which all are very uh, necessary and important. This particular issue is taking a backseat in a way that it sounds like some fanciful like person being being sensitive 
you know, they go get over it, but this is not a get over it. This is real. And uh, well, there's so much history. There's so much culture. There's so much. Po- if you want to understand our ancient history, you need to understand that relationship to the stars right. and to the cosmos, right? That right. emotional that's, that's connection. Yeah. Um, all, all, all this is happening so fast, both right. light and, and the advent of satellites, that the unexpected consequences. Obviously, there's good and there's bad, you know, uh, right. to this. Mm-hmm. And people think, oh, we're decreasing the fossil footprint. Oh, we're improving communication to parts of the world that didn't have computer access. Right. Well, there's a big price to pay for this, too. And, right. and, and that, that part of it has not been well looked at and or well represented. Yeah. The, yeah. The, there's a price to pay for everything. Yeah, yeah. So what would you like to see in the future, John? Where do we, I mean, in an yeah. ideal scenario? Um, I, I wish that um, humanity would take a different view to all of this. I know that's a lot to ask for. Um, I'm very worried that uh, all of these concerns are going to be completely swamped by climate change in the next few decades, mm-hmm. that there's going to be so much emphasis and, and tension put on climate change that there won't be very much oxygen left in the room for anything else. Um, but But to that exact point that people don't take it seriously. They think that this is, uh, whether it's satellites or whether it's light pollution, that this is somehow optional, that uh, it's not really that big of a deal. Oh, it doesn't matter whether we can see the stars at night. Um, It all seems very short-sighted to me. Uh, And especially given that it's not an either or kind of a choice. It's not, you can have uh, a safe city at night, or you can have the stars, and that those are mutually exclusive options. It's not really that at all. And if more people were aware of that, if they could see examples of good lighting at night, for example, um, it would really change how they viewed the problem. And we would get to the point where the majority of people wanted a solution to that problem. Once you can get to that critical mass, things begin to change very quickly and organically on the other side of that. But we're still trying to get to that critical mass. And each well, of us can have a role in, in getting there. And, yeah. my, and Michael, you know, I, I, uh, but Michael's saying it's, it's an issue that doesn't get enough attention or funding to address. The satellite operators are not being required to cover the cost for emerging issues like space traffic management, et cetera. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're so. creating the problem. You should be responsible for the problem and the cost of managing right, it. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So, well, thank you, Tony. Anything else? Well, thank you. I appreciate having a chance to, to get my two cents oh, in. Oh. Well, and, you're the one that brought really, this really enjoy time. your comments, John. And, and Scott, your pictures are so stunning. Yeah. Hello, Scott. There you yeah, are. Are we here? I just want to say, um, in Sedona, when I moved here 11 years ago, the main street through West Sedona, which is the main part of Sedona, uh, was so black that people were jaywalking and getting hit by cars. And it created a problem in so it's a dark sky community. They had to figure it out. So I would come out to the main highway and it was dark. And then there was talk about putting in lights all along the main road of West Sedona. This is before you guys moved here. We were all nervous. Oh my God, because I'm shooting the Milky Way and it was out every night. And I would go up to the airport and look down and see how dark Sedona was. So they figured out they're going to put lights all along the streets. And the day came and they did it. And I went up to the airport and I looked down and it did not change a thing. They had light all across. You could come across. And Jay walked, which you shouldn't, but people, you know, it was much safer. It's incredible. But from up there, the night sky was completely unaffected, just like you guys were talking about. And so it works. These kind of lights work. They, they angle down. Angle down. And there was no spill light going up there. And the, the nervousness that all of us as photographers and other people that lived here that enjoy living here, we were so worried. It, I, so it works. It was, and it's always been like that. And now it's safer to drive through Sedona but we still have our night sky. So I just wanted to say that. They do work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for, for confirming that, yeah. that this technology really does work when it's intelligently placed. We, for ourselves, have a lot of motion detector lights. So they turn on when there's somebody there that needs to see the Focused way. Focused in a they downward turn way. Off. Right, yeah, everything's, yeah. and it's like a black cover. Make it go down yeah, to yeah, the yeah, ground. Yeah. That's yeah. where you need to see where to put your feet. 
All right, so. Can I respond to uh, Scott? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay. Uh, the, the change may be if you go up to the airport, it, it's unchanged. But if you're down uh, sort of where people live, it is changed. Ah, it's it's just not the price you're paying. It's not for free. Yeah. Well, I think it was a safety issue. Yeah. Well, I know. I know. Have to and find that there's a balance, but yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. 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 I, I understand. Yeah. Uh, and don't jaywalk. That's a busy street. <laughs> well, There's yeah. crosswalks. Yeah. Well, well yeah. there are other ways. You might have more crosswalks or something like that, too. Who knows? But, uh, yeah. but uh, And then there's also the issue that John brought up beautifully, and that is the, the light that's back backscattered off, off the road. That yeah. Goes on. yeah. You know, we have, we Oops, have um, taken off the checks and balances so much from nature and how we live, John. And I think that to understand the impact of it on our health, on our enjoyment, on the other creatures on the planet, on uh, on everything that we do, we need to be so responsible for these checks and balances, and to understand the cost of them. And mm -hmm. not, you know, um, who was it? Who was citing Tony? You were <laughs> citing your your friend who said, uh, "If you can, you will." Right. If if it's possible, people will do it. You give them the opportunity, and somebody will exercise that. And so, all of our toys, all of our tools, all of our technology, we need to think about its impact. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we shaping the. So, oh, who was it last week? Uh -huh. um, Thomas uh, Herman Green was quoting Thomas Berry. Oh yeah. And Thomas Berry said, "We don't need to ask how we want the Earth to be. We can also ask." How does Earth want us to be? Mm. How can we live within its constraints so that we are sustainable, so that we can go forward, so that it's, and we're all stakeholders, that all of us have a voice, that we can all enjoy the planet as much as we can, not just for the few to, to exercise everything that they want to do, but what, what do we all agree on? What is the Earth that we can all agree on? What is the Earth agreeing for us to, to have residency here? Or you, there's a mass extinction going on that we're responsible for. And we're a yeah. single issue of cultures many times where we're talking about yeah. uh, something like an electric car. It's not going to solve everything. It's going to help. It's going to have its impact. But that's only one issue, but it gets so much press. And there's yeah. so many other things going on at the same time. And, and we have to be thinking at these multitude yeah. of issues all at the same time to, to be able to end up where we want to go. Um, there's a new uh, system of design. Um, it has been earth-centered design, life-centered design. Right, exactly. We're going to yeah. have conversations on that moving Coming forward up, yeah. about understanding the impact of everything that we do on the larger sphere mm. of things. Mm -hmm. And we're really talking about the larger sphere of things. We're talking about our place in the world, um, our understanding of that place in relationship to this big cosmos, which has been capturing our attention a fascinating view for so long. And I, I have to advocate that early societies who had unfettered access to that view put so much of their understanding in their art, in their architecture, in their cosmology, in their mythology, in their sense of identity. Right. And uh, we need to, I mean, that that is a cost that we could be losing, mm -hmm. our understanding of who we truly are in the greater sphere of the universe. Right. 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 And that one picture of our planet from space that our technology afforded us has really understand, uh, helped us understand we live on the tiny blue dot. Right. This is our spaceship Earth. In right. the words of Buckminster Fuller, this is something so fragile and so precious and so privileged. Mm -hmm. We are in such a privileged seat right. to, to make this difference. Do you want to speak to that about what is our responsibility here? Um, it, it has to be active. It has to be something that reflects our values as a people. And certainly we can't just hope that somebody else does something about it. Um, there is a, I, I'll read you this quotation that has stuck in my head ever since I came across it several years ago. Um, and it's attributed to a, a, a forest engineer from Senegal in West Africa named Baba Dioum who was giving a presentation at a meeting of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature in the late 1960s. And he said, in the end, we will only conserve what we love. Mm. We will love only what we understand and we will understand only what we are taught. And if you follow that chain from 
understanding to appreciating something to the point that we want to preserve it. And then that leads us to conservation. Th that seems to be the, the path we have to follow with any of this in order to get people motivated to want to do something about it. Otherwise, it's this slow and silent progression over time. It's the people that I talk to, older folks who say, yeah, I remember when I was a kid in the 1950s and where we lived, you could see the stars. And, and now I go look and I don't see that anymore because that progression was so slow mm -hmm. that this sort of window shifted over time and they didn't even perceive that it shifted. Mm -hmm. And you have to bring their attention back to it in order for them to say, oh, wait, something's different now. Well, mm -hmm. what happened? And that leads you down that road that hopefully um, brings you to the point where you build an awareness and then a, a, a value around a, a set of principles. And you say, I want my children, grandchildren, the people that come after them to have access to what I had when I was growing up. But then you have to go out and do the work. And that's difficult for a lot of people. The law of increments, right? I was startled to see a monarch butterfly flying around um, because we used to see a lot of monarchs, right? And now yeah. their habitat has been destroyed, uh, the vagaries of, of what we're doing. Mm. Um, it's rare now to see butterflies. They used to be common. We used to, weren't you dancing with the fireflies when you were a kid? Yeah. Where are they? Right? So this, we're losing, we're losing so much. Mm -hmm. But that view of the stars, when you look at historically what this night sky has meant to us, right. how, you know, I think we're adapted by the light of a campfire, right? Twinkling, that we used to sit around the campfire at night and the stars twinkling. And that puts us into a state of being mesmerized by dancing lights, by mythology, by telling stories, by community, by the sense of expansion. I think we're geared to that. And I think our fascination with our phones now is we're all staring at a screen and it's twinkling lights at us or the big screen of the movie theater or the screen of the television theater. I mean, we need to think about what we're replacing. We're geared to be fascinated by a dark screen with twinkling lights. Mm. We have spent generations the it's long human history. Yeah. We would gather at night around the campfire, tell stories, spin stories, mm -hmm. bond, community, um, feeling that expansion. Right. And now these have um, replaced it. And I, I think that to lose the greatest screen of all, the night sky and its twinkling lights, is, um, is yeah. such a tragedy. So I want to suggest for everyone who has not seen the full tilt, dazzling night sky, Take a trip, go to a remote place. There are known places, what are they? I know Bryce Canyon is one of them. Um, and I think we went there just to see the night sky. Don't stay in a hotel, it's got lights. Go car camping, which is what we did. Step out at 3 a.m., sit back on the hood of your car. And uh, I wouldn't be on the ground with scorpions, trust me. Um, but you know, <laughs> just bedazzle yourself, drink it in. Yeah. Go to star parties, drink in the yeah. stars. Yeah. That light coming down is just like, it's nourishment. The, the, the ultimate heart, for the soul, for mindful the meditation. Yeah, yeah. It's oh the, my God. Yeah, go course, get yeah. thee to a dark sky. You don't need to sky. go to a workshop. You don't, we yeah. celebrate, oh yeah, we're in a dark sky community. It's not the same as the truly dark, dark, dark skies. Right, right, Where right. are the darker places on earth? And there should be ecotourism. And make everybody, you know, wear those <laughs> red filtered flashlights. Where are the darkest spots in the world left? Well, you can see some of them in uh, the, the background uh, uh, for my Zoom here. You have to go to places now uh, like uh, the Canadian Arctic, Siberia, the Saharan Desert, the Amazon Basin. Some of those areas are, are have better weather than others. Um, you know, you're, you're not going to see a lot of stars probably if you go to the Amazon. It's cloudy there a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. um, the deserts are good places to look for that. Um, so, it, it, but the point is you have to, you have to go further and further. Now, if you're in a, an area like here in the United States, you really have to come out west. There's just not much natural darkness left in the eastern half of the, the country. And to your point, Laura, there actually is a form of ecotourism based around this. It's come to be called astrotourism. Uh -huh. um, and uh, right out here in our part of the world, if you consider just the Colorado Plateau, which is um, the Four Corners, essentially Four Corners region 
Um, there is a study that was published a couple of years ago suggesting that in the decade of the 2020s that that form of tourism will be worth something in the neighborhood of about $5 billion to the economy of that region and will sustain a couple of thousand jobs. So the, the point is that this is not only something that's kind of a nice to have, but it's also creating economic opportunity in areas that are experiencing some economic depression because their extractive industries like mining and forestry are being drawn down and they're leaving. So we're offering in exchange for that a fully sustainable form of tourism that only requires that you just keep what you already have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that you could set up um, dwellings and, and the, all the stuff that tourists need in a very dark sky way. They might come away thinking, wow, that was fun and that's doable. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, why may not bring that more of that back to my own uh, home or own community. So uh, I know that you're also a consultant. You consult national parks. Are national parks also uh, threatened, or how, what are they oh, like asking a, a you about? Chaco Canyon. Tell us about. Oh yeah. yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, they they are threatened. Uh, you know, obviously, if you go to uh, the National Mall in Washington D.C., which are mostly run by the the Park Service, the monuments and things, you're in the middle of a big city, and you could argue that the, the it's already sort of been lost there. Things could still be improved. I'm most worried about these large, the, the crown jewels of the National Park Service system that are out here, particularly in the West, that are very vulnerable to the growth of the so-called mega cities. An example that I use, I, I, I don't have a, a quick visual I can show you, but uh, Great Basin National Park, which is um, just inside the, the border of Utah and Nevada, and about, as the crow flies, about 200 miles or so from Las Vegas, the, the light dome of Las Vegas is very noticeable on the southern horizon from Great Basin. So to give you an idea of the reach of the cities in impacting those places, when you go there, you'll still see a tremendous night sky in Great Basin, but then you'll look over to the south and you'll see that light dome and you'll be reminded of the fact that the city is there at a distance. So it's, it's not good enough just to say, well, there are these dark places and they exist and that's fine and I don't have to think about it. The challenge is how we get people to care about that. Mm -hmm. Somebody who's never been to Great Basin or uh, Yellowstone or Grand Canyon to care about the quality of their night skies so that they're preserved for the future. But it's in the same way that we've been worried about that for decades in terms of, you know, how do you convince somebody who, you know, maybe from the inner city in the East Coast of the United States and probably will never go to one of those national parks Mm -hmm. but to convince them to care about it because it's part of our national heritage and it's something we should be proud of. Yeah. I, I bet children get very excited by this. Yeah. Children want to plant more trees. Children want to preserve the planet that they're going to inherit. Children mm -hmm. uh, want this. So I think that's uh, also a, you know, a good science project yeah. for kids, right? Hey, teachers out there, you know, <laughs> kids grab this one and take hold, I think. Um, this has been fascinating. There's something that each of us can do. Um, what is it? Darksky.org, the mm -hmm. website. A lot of education on that. Um, I just want to um, thank you. Scotty, I want to thank you for showing us your gorgeous pictures of what truly the Milky Way can be. Uh, we look forward to December 11th when we're going to have the full tour around the world of all your glorious photography. And I want to hear how much you put into it to stay out there for hours at a time to capture that perfect shot. So thank you for that. That's going to be exciting. Uh, Tony, I want to say thank you for bringing this and so many other topics to us, being an advisor to this institute, bringing your, your pals, uh, Diana Dragomir, astrobiologist, next week. Uh, you'll come back and also Bob Woody Woodruff, um, engineer who designed so many of the telescopes that help us see further and farther that you are an exciting team and we're thankful that you'll be back next week to celebrate what the James Webb Space Telescope is bringing us and John you know thank you for all that you do um, I wanted to ask you quickly about your books an intriguing title The Lost Constellations you've written three books can you tell us what you've written and uh, what you cover in those just briefly, the, the idea behind the Lost Constellations is that if you open a, a magazine like Sky and Telescope for Astronomy and there's a star chart in the middle, you'll see the names of exactly 88 constellations that are from our Western tradition. 
And those were settled on as sort of permanent by the astronomical community about a hundred years ago. But before that, it was a bit of the wild west in terms of what was considered a constellation and what their boundaries were and which stars belonged to which. And along the way, there were some figures in the night sky that were just sort of dropped. They weren't included in that canon that became official uh, in around 1930. And so I dug into that history, which is fascinating. There's a lot of, of uh, human drama in the backstories associated with them. And then for each of them, I pulled a, a, an image of, of the figure off of a historical star chart and I superimposed it on a modern chart. So if your sky is dark enough, because they tend to be fainter stars, you could go out and you could find that lost constellation. They're still there in the night sky if you know where to look for them. And as a, a little uh, curiosity in the history of astronomy, it was just a fascinating project to research and write about. Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, yeah. You know, different cultures put different stars together in different patterns to make their own constellations, but they all did it. They all, with pattern recognition, created different images, different mythical um, entities, right, be they human right, right. Or, or animal, um, for these constellations. They even say there's a really good evidence, and I remember interviewing Frank Edge about this like oh, yeah. decades ago, yeah. that Lascaux, um, the paintings, the Hall of Bulls, has embedded in it star charts. So even the people 20,000 years ago, standing outside that cave, he was saying, here is what they saw at different times of year, and this is what they painted, and you can correlate them. I mean, how fascinating is that? There's another example, and this would speak also to our eyes and also the darkness of the sky. But Weston Price, oh. in Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, his right. book, he went to uh, really remote communities back in the 1940s or something. 1940s, and, yeah. Uh, and looking at what... what um, the diet, the, diet the, the Western the, diet, mm -hmm. how it degraded us was his theory, um, white flour, white sugar. But he cites in that book, um, and I've got to research where exactly this is, but there is a petroglyph that shows the Pleiades with additional stars. And how could they, pe people early on without telescopes have known right in the right place, there were these additional stars that are visible, but only under certain conditions, and you'd have to have really good eyes to see it um, be in a petroglyph from so long ago. So evidence that we could see more stars even um, in earlier decades. We Our uh, eyes were better earlier equipped. Centuries earlier. Earlier, <laughs> earlier eras. Eras, that's a better word. Eras will cover it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, how fascinating, how long we've been observing the sky, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, Thank you. I appreciate um, all of you today. Scott, your images, John, yeah. your research, your dedication, yeah. uh, Tony advising us for so long. Um, it's, yeah. such, it's such a great community to get together and really talk about this stuff, about what matters to us and what influence we have and how can we, through dialogue, move the dial, right? right. That's the whole mission here. And uh, appreciate, appreciate we, all you do. We love doing. finding these astronomical uh, calendars and places in, in these sacred sites around the world and what they all mean and we want to uh, but ultimately it came down to just the human experience of, of documenting one's life it wasn't some special relationship. mystical thing it was like this is how we plant this is how we live this is where we want to be a certain time well, of the year there was always a data to support well, life itself at, yeah we've looked at how uh, early cultures navigated the pacific ocean through just star charts and, right, and reading that's true. the waves and the birds, Not right? Too long ago. You would need to know the stars there. Right, right. And if you mm -hmm. want to follow the grand cycles of time, the <laughs> turn of the of the cos right, the turn of the cosmos tracks that. Yeah. Or, you know, the solar calendars, sun here, uh, sun set, yeah, different yeah. times of year. You're tracking your year. Yeah, that's it another discussion to have with Tony uh, with uh, Chaco Canyon. His archaeoastronomy. Archaeoastronomy discussion is yeah. another topic. So, but, so those right. stars have counted in our life for <laughs> so long. Thank you so much. Is this, Appreciate is your this time. pretty much what you work on, John? Do you have other aspects to your work? Did we you not also, cover something? Did yeah. we miss something? Some other yeah. part of the astronomy that you're. Yeah. This is it. This is your. No, I mean you pretty much pretty much got it. This is this is what I do, and and it was a good overview of it. Uh, and of course, as as I mentioned, I really do encourage people to take a look at IDA's website. There's a tremendous amount of educational material there, information to empower people to create change in their own communities. 
that will bring back the stars that will help shore up this connection that we have with the cosmos and i hope everybody will will take a moment to think about it wonderful and, and you know yeah. for your local newspapers i think this is a topic that they could cover as well what can we do as a community to bring more of that and help preserve it so maybe all the reporters you can get in touch with and really start advocating for this if you advocate if you make a noise people will listen and people will learn yeah. And also to backtrack just for a moment, we used to live very close to the headquarters of Costco. And they're a very progressive company with, uh, with social uh, responsible themes to oh, their yeah. entire ethos. Yeah. So I'm sure that what we discussed today will impact them, but just by a few letters and, and discussing it with them. So thank you for the advice on that. But that should spread up, not just Costco, all of the different corporate organizations that have the same issue going on. Um, I, I know that yeah. they would be, I, I really believe that they would want to lead the way in that way. They give them an yeah. opportunity. And I think, Tony, it's a buyer who just didn't understand yeah. the, the yeah. consequences. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so, all thank right. Thank you so much. Well, John, Appreciate your time today. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, thank you so much, John.